All right, so let's get started. Good afternoon, RVA Sec. Um, I am a first time speaker, so I apologize in advance if uh, I make weird hand motions or talk weirdly. Um, so the talk, if obviously, is uh, embracing my inner cyber wizard to defeat imposter syndrome. Um, I am a senior information security engineer at Virginia 529. Um, we're going to give a brief summary of my talk. So we're going to do a deep dive to imposter syndrome. Um, I'm going to talk about imposter syndrome in information security. Um, there's a little bit of ranting in there, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> We're going to talk about what was in the uh, summary of the talk, the hacker grimoire and its origins, and then some lessons learned overall. Uh, and sort of your too long didn't watch is take good notes, darn it. Uh, I know it was important in school, but it, I guarantee you it'll help you in the future. Um, so I need to give a disclaimer. Uh, I talked to my lawyers. They forced me to say this. Um, I'm not going to say anything weird in this talk, but um, just to cover my bases, I will say the statement exactly as it is written. I'm here to represent myself with my own opinions. These statements made and opinions expressed in this presentation do not necessarily represent those of the Virginia College Savings Plan or the Commonwealth of Virginia. We are an independent state agency. Uh, additionally, I'm pretty stupid. Um, I'll openly admit that. I've tried my best to make sure that everything is accurate in my slides. If I've missed anything, if there's any significant omissions, it's probably due to stupidity instead of malice, uh, although obviously in security we might swing either way. Uh, so quickly about who I am. Um, I've been in information security my entire professional career out of college. Uh, I was very uh, blessed to start my work in a SOC as a good old SOC monkey. Um, worked my way up the ladder to the CERT, which was awesome. Jumped careers a little bit to do some customer engineering for security solutions. Um, and then finally got to be more of a systems engineer where I'm current role is um, along with like DevSecOps, which uh, if you're just in here, the guy talking about DevSecOps, that stuff was ringing really good in my ears. Um, notably, my interest in information security has gone on significantly longer than my career. Um, I, <laughs> ever since I pretty much put a computer together, I was breaking stuff pretty regularly. Um, computers, networks, et cetera. Um, it's always been in me. Um, because of that, I've sort of become sort of an amateur historian. Um, obviously, historians are, are I'm not going to call myself a straight-out historian, but um, I'm really into hacker culture and information security as it's developed over the years. Um, there's a lot of great books out there, a lot of great movies, and so on, um, which may or may not play a factor in my discussion later. Uh, I'm also a giant nerd. Shout out to my community of VGZ.CX. Um, big into anime, sci-fi, 3D printing, 90s tech. I have a ton of PDAs. I love it. It's amazing. Old technology is so fascinating in its own way. And obviously build onto the systems that we have here today. I actually gave myself a speaker note to slow down because I was going to go through this too quickly. So, But I am going to return to the disclaimer slide because I'm not a doctor. I'm not trained in psychology. Talk to experts. I know that's something that most of us know what to do. You want to talk to an expert when you don't know something. Therapy is awesome. I have uh, I had the privilege of having an awesome roommate in college who became a therapist. She's amazing. She gave me some things because I asked her. I said, I was really nervous about this talk. Give me some tips. She's like, most insurances cover it. You don't even realize it, or at least cover part of it, right? Obviously, that's a weird conversation. I'm not going to get into the details of health insurance in the United States, but, you know. Um, additionally, Psychology Today, which is actually the website for a psychology journal, is a great resource to find therapists near you. It is perfectly fine if you need help to talk to a therapist. Just do it. Like, it's okay. Um, so, on those lines, let's talk about imposter syndrome. So, I am going to read this definition because I feel it is important. It is from the National Institutes of Health. Imposter syndrome is a behavioral health phenomenon described as self-doubt of intellect, skills, or accomplishments among high-achieving individuals. These individuals can internalize their success and subsequently experience pervasive feelings of self-doubt, anxiety, depression, and or apprehension, apprehension of being exposed as a fraud in their work despite verifiable and objective evidence of their successfulness. Um, now, there is some argument about the actual term. Most of the time in popular articles, you're going to see it as imposter syndrome. Um, imposter phenomenon is also something that gets used a lot in psychological texts, um, as well as um, imposter experience, although I haven't seen that one as much. Um, for the purpose of my talk, I'm going to use imposter syndrome pretty much exclusively. Um, but uh, I also find humor in the fact that IS, IS, um, information security, imposter syndrome, right? Brief history, um, it was first written about in the 70s by doctors Clance and Imes. Um, Clance then proceeded to write a book called The Imposter Phenomenon, When Success Makes You Feel Like a Fake, uh, in 1985. Since then, 
there have been 20, or excuse me, 62 studies that have been done. The National Institute of Health in 2019 did a, um, a categorization and uh, a, a systematic review of all the live documentation, which is something that uh, science researchers do a lot of, systematic reviews. I think they're really cool. We should probably do more of them in our industry, in, in all honesty, but um, much ink has been spilt on this topic although it is not currently defined in the APA's DSM, which is sort of their guidebook to um, diagnosing psychological disorders. It's also not in the International Classification of Diseases, which is also a text along those same lines. So while it is something that we deal with, it's not necessarily something that has a, uh, a diagnosis that's clear cut, right? So let's talk about sort of a cycle of imposter syndrome. And this is something I've dealt with, and I'm sure many people in this room have probably dealt with, right? Um, seven out of 10 adults in studies have claimed to deal with some aspect of this, right? And I'm sure the number is probably a little bit higher because some people will probably have imposter syndrome, syndrome deep enough that they don't want to admit that they have it, right? Um, so we talk about first, a wild project appears. You're really excited. You have a task. Your boss is giving you this really important task. You got to get it done because, you know, everything else at your company is at risk of failing if you don't get this done. That's a lot of pressure, right? You're going to get anxiety. Um, I'm a chronic procrastinator. I literally was working on these slides till last night. Uh, in fact, actually, I worked on slides this morning for a reason I'll explain later, but um, it, it can be a lot, right? That anxiety, that procrastination, it really kind of gets you. So the good news is, though, is through all that, you complete the project. Now, you would think, Completing the project, like that's the end of the cycle, right? No, 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 no. You have this rationalization that maybe somebody else could have done it better and I just got lucky because I got given the task and therefore I did the task, right? Well, guess what that leads to? More anxiety, more self-doubt, right? And then guess what? You don't have enough time to think about it because new threat actor appears and you have to describe to upper management why we have to uh, take down all our exchange servers for a few hours, right? This is real stuff that people deal with on a regular basis. You know, are you even good enough to have imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> um, so do we need to have research on medical stuff gets you cool new terms? I really think that the CTI community should take up comorbidities. I think it's a really cool term. Um, essentially, these are the things that come along with your imposter syndrome. So if you suffer from one of these, you may be suffering from imposter syndrome. At least that's sort of the jump we get, right? Some perfectionism. Uh, well, I can't claim to be a perfectionist. There's probably an error on this slide somewhere, right? Um, superheroism. Well, that one I can definitely feel like I absolutely try to wear the S when I can, you know, the Superman S, right? Um, the denial of competence and capability. This is simply along the same lines of what we're talking about with self-doubt, right? We're talking about, am I capable of doing this? Was I good enough this time? Um, and then the two fun ones at the bottom. Uh, a tick phobia, which is a fear of failure. So you learned a new phobia today, congratulations. Uh, and achievement phobia, which is the fear of success. So fear of failure, fear of success. Obviously, these sorts of things are gonna sort of lead to the scary stuff that are symptoms that may be diagnosed by like a, a therapist, right? Your anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, stress-related disorders, depression, obviously, that's a really heavy topic, right? And finally, burnout. And I think in our industry especially, I think we can all agree that burnout is real, right? Um, I, I'm gonna say it now and then I'll say it later in my slide. Um, take your damn PTO. <laughs> like, if you have infinite PTO at your company, like, uh, there's arguments we can have about that. I'm not gonna get into business politics, but take your damn PTO. Like, you have that time off, it's yours. The paycheck at the end of the year that you might get from some companies that are nice enough to give you like a quarter or half the time, it, it's not worth it. Like take a day off, take a Friday off, um, go smell some roses, touch some grass, right? <laughs> so uh, let's talk about information security. So we dig through a big spaghetti monster there, right? IS and IS. So going back to my definition, any high functioning adult deals with this. So a lot of literature that you'll find um, actually talks about medical professionals, which I think is a little bit of a bias that maybe some of those researchers have, right? They're, they're medical researchers, researching medical professionals. So obviously they're gonna talk to their buddies about it and they're gonna sit around the bar and go, yeah, dude, I totally have imposter syndrome. Um, not a lot of literature has been written about information security specifically. There have been some studies about business professionals in general. Um, 
So hopefully that'll change, right? There's been more of a focus on this in the industry. Um, more thought leaders who tend to sort of, I wouldn't say dictate policy, but do tend to get the, the tides moving in the right direction have been talking about it, right? Um, there was a really good, funnily enough, I was at Black Hat last year. I didn't actually see the imposter syndrome talk at Black Hat last year, but apparently it was awesome, um, which in hindsight sounds kind of silly. Um, but uh, it, you know, it is something that's starting to get talked about, which is great. I feel that the more we talk about this as a community, as an industry, I think more or less allows us to have more of a focus on it. Um, and obviously, I am a pretty, well, relatively, mildly obese white guy with a beard. I can't speak to other people's experiences. I can't speak to women's experiences with this, LGBTQ people of color. I can't speak to that. I can only speak to my own, but studies around this, and even the study that initially was done that, that spurred the book was actually about specifically women in business. So I know that this isn't something that isn't just affecting a, a weird bearded white guy or glasses like myself. It's affecting a lot of people in this industry. And I think us all coming together, whatever uh, shape, color, or gender you are, I think it's really important to, to accept that we can talk about this as a community. Um, so doing my research, thinking about this, I've sort of boiled this down to three pressure buckets. Now, this is my own research. I'm not basing this off a document. Um, so I'm probably wrong, but that's fine. Um, first of all, we'll talk about industry pressures, we'll talk about organizational pressures, and then we'll talk about your external pressures. So with industry pressures, I'm going to show you three maps. And um, our keynote today was awesome because it actually described one of these maps, and I'll get to it when I get there. The first one a lot of people have seen before. This is the, the Henry Zhang um, cybersecurity domains map. It's a giant map. Um, there is so much in here, and, and unfortunately, it, it kind of plays a little weird on the projector. If you look it up yourself, it, it really is a giant map just full of information, right? Um, and since this was written in uh, last updated in March of 2021, it's actually missing some stuff. Um, we're missing like AI and ML. We're missing blockchain. Um, I actually don't see, they did say IoT security, but we actually don't have a, anything related to operational technologies or ICS. Um, so, like, even documents written by great thought thinkers are still missing information. That is stuff that you are expected to know as a security engineer, right? Like, you're expected to know your domain, and those domains can be multiple uh, spaghetti monsters of information, right? You, here's your second map. So, any guesses what this is? This is the site map from RSA this year. Um, each, each one of these little boxes, that's a vendor. There's 650 of them or so, as our keynote speaker actually talked about. Um, so many different companies and technologies out there. And once again, especially if you're in a smaller team, uh, a smaller security team, you're expected to know like a bunch about a lot of these, right? You're supposed to know most of the EDR vendors. You need to know most of the firewall vendors. You need to know most of these vendors in niche product categories. Because at the end of the day, when your budget comes up and you need to give suggestions, I don't know, throw a dart at this wall, right? Like, you're going to find something in there. Um, and this doesn't even cover all of, like, the open source frameworks that you have to deal with on a regular basis, you know, and which obviously love open source software. Nothing wrong with that. But that compounds on top of all these companies that sell you a product. This isn't to say that any particular company is bad. You have to buy me a drink to get those discussions. <laughs> but it, it really goes to show that we're, we work in a complicated industry, right? Um, and then the third map actually kind of relates to the previous speaker in this room um, and something I recently got into as part of my current gig, which I, I'm, I'm learning as I go, which is cool, which is DevSecOps, right? These are all the infrastructure pieces for a full stack developer that I have to have some familiarity with to be able to do my job properly, right? I might not need to be able to like program stuff in JavaScript, but I kind of need to be able to know what to look for with regards to remote code execution stuff, right? Like stuff that the code does that I'm not aware of otherwise and keeping tabs on what my developers are doing, right? So looked at as an expert for that and that's sort of like a personal gripe more than anything. Um, and there's missing things as well in here, right? Like they talk about AWS and Azure, um, but like Google Cloud is a thing, Oracle Cloud is a thing, right? We're missing companies on these, on these uh, diagrams, which goes to show like I looked for bigger diagrams. One, they don't show up as well on, on slides and you could find those yourself if you really want, but um, there, there is niche products that companies go for that you join a company and go, oh, that's a niche product I didn't know about. Um, 
I'll go into a small diatribe of my current employer uses a product called Snow. There's like three or four different companies that have Snow in their name. There's ServiceNow, there's a company that's actually called Snow, um, there's Snowflake, which I'm not going to talk about because of current news, but <laughs> let's move on to the organizational pressures. This is the stuff that is your work stuff, right? Your job performance, this is a pressure on you on a regular basis. Um, I love the, the hydraulic press channel. If, if you're not aware, he just crushes stuff with a hydraulic press, like it's, it's money. Um, so job performance, right? Like for me personally, I have a giant sense of pride and, and a weight of responsibility on my shoulders for the security of my company. It's part of what I signed for on my contract to do my job. That's pressure, right? Like straight up. Um, and obviously, yeah, on top of that, your performance versus expectations for your job requirements, right? You want to get your raises at the end of the year. You have to do work and do work well. And you, that weighs heavily on your mind when you're working, right? Um, additionally, if you have a small team, stress and correlation, there's definitely a stress between correlation and workload. Um, there have been work studies done on this before. Um, and additionally, like team member numbers are important. Obviously, I'm not a CISO, I can't make these decisions, but man, would I kill for another two or three engineers on my team to help out with doing stuff in my seam, right? Like, dang, I would really love to do some more pen testing on the applications that my company does. I'm saying that as a generality, not maybe specifically with me, right? And then additionally, that work-life balance discussion, right? And I, there's a pretty good YouTuber that makes those shorts, the lady with the cup, uh, if you're familiar, you're familiar. If you're not, that's cool. Um, but her whole thing is joking about work-life balance and bosses having crazy expectations about not taking PTO, for instance. Um, and additionally, like, right, like we, at the end of the day, we're all working to get paid. Like you're doing a job to get paid. That's the, 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 uh, the capitalist agreement that we've decided upon. So playing that corporate game is an important thing. It's also a massive stress when it comes to your organizational stuff. And then finally, my third bucket, right? The third bucket is your external pressures. This is the stuff that's harder to reconcile with either your bosses specifically or your coworkers or technology, right? Some of this stuff is technology, right? Like this is from uh, Verizon's DBIR. This is the ransomware increase over the last four years, or sorry, a scale is wrong. It's six years. Here's your, uh, your 4,000 APT groups that Mandiant would love to sell you products based on. Um, this is fine. Everything's fine here, right? There's always a new threat actor. There's always a new exploit. There's always a new vector. There's always a new threat. Um, so much so, as I said, I modified these slides literally at like six o'clock this morning. Um, Microsoft's India's Twitter account got popped and was promoting Roaring Kitty cryptocurrency for like a solid eight to 10 hours yesterday. Um, I, you know, obviously I, I Condolences to that team. I'm sure they are like, what happened here? Um, although, of course, it's, it's Twitter, so I mean, I, dude, I don't even know anymore. So, I've talked about a bunch of bad stuff. How do we win? Well, there's a bunch of cool stuff here, right? For one, focus on yourself and your career and interest, right? Um, one thing that I've been reading a lot that some of those thought leaders have been talking about recently is finding your niche, right? If you're a dang good EDR engineer, get good at being an EDR engineer. You might need to learn other technologies to be able to expand it, but like get good at that. And getting good at that will lead ultimately to you being an expert in that field in some way that you can be, that maybe that imposter syndrome kind of leaks out a little bit. Maybe you lose it a little bit because you actually know your stuff. And especially if you think about it, right? You look at those three maps I presented, right? There's so much out there you have to find your niche, right? If you don't find your niche, you're, you, it's, it's, it's a amount of weight that will just collapse your shoulders. Um, don't fake it till you make it. I know that's a funny line that a lot of people say, but realistically speaking, you're literally signing yourself up for imposter syndrome. You're literally doing the thing that the word says, right? Um, you're just asking for trouble. Um, present to yourself. I'm presenting myself. I am absolutely stressed out of my mind, but that's okay, right? Um, but I'm not saying that you have to have a talk at a conference. I'm not saying that you, you have to do that at all. What I am saying is you are you. Present yourself, right? Um, and we'll get to a point in this talk where we'll talk about things that maybe can help you in that respect. Um, this is a, you don't have to sign yourself up to talk at a conference if it just absolutely scares the, the uh, Jesus out of you. And then finally, well, not finally, finally for this slide at least, um, stop comparing yourself to others, right? Um, I was always taught to be yourself. 
comparing yourself to others is a really good way to get that imposter syndrome, right? Like, I work with a gentleman who is a amazing guy. He's, a, he's the, the security architect, so he's right above me. The guy has a wealth of knowledge that I hope to one day be able to have. I'm not there yet in my career, right? Like, I've been working in the industry about 13 years. He's been in the industry over 20. Recognizing the fact that I could get there eventually really can help you understand that, like, you're early, if you're, especially if you're early in your journey, you'll get there. It's just, you gotta work at it, right? So, continue on in the winning. Um, chat with your colleagues, right? Um, I have a couple of Discord groups that I'm a big fan of. Um, Black Hills Information Security, awesome shout out to them. Their Discord is amazing. Anti-Siphon, which is their training arm, also has a great Discord. Um, I have a couple of personal Discords that I'm a fan of, of myself, that like, of people that I've worked with over the course of my career, we all, console when something goes bad in our work, which is great. Um, and there's a bunch of other professional groups out there too. You know, there's your IC2s. Uh, I believe we had one, we have one here at the conference, uh, ISCA, ISACA, acronyms are great. Um, <laughs> um, you know, get to these professional groups because there's gonna be like-minded individuals in those groups. Don't be an island. Um, once again, I'm gonna reiterate it. Therapy is great, do therapy. Uh, take your time off. Like. Once again, I talked about these stuff in here. I'm recapping it because it makes sense to recap it. And then finally, where I'm gonna lead into sort of with, we're talking about the hacker grimoire, take note of your accomplishments, right? Um, I'm sure HR people, managers will love me saying this, right? Um, anybody who works for bigger organizations, you have, uh, you, you usually have an HR system that you have to take a notation in anyways to for your end of your reviews. Having a resource to be able to refer to is a really great idea. Um, I suggest maybe the hacker grimoire. So, what is this about a hacker grimoire? Uh, so first of all, I'm a definitions man. Let's talk about grimoire. I love pronunciation words. I, I couldn't tell you what that says, but I've been told it's grimoire. Once again, I'm dumb, so if I'm mispronouncing it, that would feel pretty bad, but that's okay. Um, a very metal definition from Merriam-Webster, a magician's manual for invoking demons and the spirits of the dead. Now. Uh, guar bars down the street, mad respects, right? Um, the term is actually derived from old French. Um, it's actually um, like a figure of speech for something being hard to understand. Um, like grammar is like a learned book. It was actually books specifically from Latin that were in French. Um, and then finally, sort of, it came to popularity in 1801, uh, an English occultist, once again, um, <laughs> Francis Barrett, he used the term in his book called the Magus, which is like, it's all like devil worship and stuff like that. I'm not gonna get into the politics behind that, but um, the term in there, from you can kind of see it's like a vertical graph where it was written in there and then it starts becoming something that people use in their day-to-day -day lexicon, right? Um, so I'm gonna Pepe Sylvia for a bit, and we're, or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you will. Um, by the way, I have a Bacon number of two. If nobody in here gets that reference, I know somebody in here gets that reference, but. Um, Let's talk about the grimoire, right? In popular traditional fantasy, wizards generally consult a grimoire. You know, you have Gandalf, he's reading his books. Um, personal favorite of mine is uh, Fairy and Journey's End. That's her reading a book. Uh, Mickey, he rides a grimoire in the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice in, 19, in the 1940s, and I'm always pondering my orb, right? Um, all of these things are like, you know, a wise person consults their book. So let's talk about fantasy and let's talk about sci-fi for a bit. So for those of you who aren't aware of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, I'm sorry, you should. Uh, he was uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, Childhood's End, Rendezvous with Rama. He's a prolific sci-fi author, uh, sorry, Sir Arthur C. Clarke. I, he is a, a knighted. Um, he, when he was writing his fantasy or his science fiction near, fi uh, near fantasy stuff, um, he followed, tend to follow three tenets. Right? When a distinguished but elderly scientist states something is possible, he's almost certainly right, but when he states something is impossible, he's probably wrong. The only way to discover the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible, right? Push beyond what you can sometimes. But the third one to me kind of rings a bit more, right? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> magic, right? Well. The stuff we work on, I would say, in information security is pretty advanced. So like, screw it, 
let's be wizards, right? <laughs> let's let's die. Let's like embrace this a bit. So, going back to my slide about who I am, one thing I really like is popular culture representations of hackers in popular culture, right? Um, so, let's talk about it, right? <laughs> If you aren't familiar with the 1992 amazing movie, Sneakers, uh, do it. Go watch it. Like, literally, after RVA sec, go watch this movie. Robert Redford, Sidney, Sidney Poitier, it's a, like, all-star movie that just doesn't have the recognition. And uh, if you have it, it's fine. Um, but do go see it. Um, there's a sequence where Whistler asks Carl for, to read some phone numbers of a little black book. These phone numbers are like ASA or uh, NSA phone numbers and like missile launch sites and stuff like that because they're discovering, well, I don't want to ruin the plot for you, but they're discovering something special. There's a reason why they're going to be dialing those numbers. Um, but you notice it's a book, right? Um, the picture down here in the bottom, this is from a German movie. I'm going to say the word 23 and not try to butcher the German. It is not <laughs> the Jim Carrey vehicle. Um, this is a film about... Uh, uh, Carl Koch, who is the uh, pretty infamous hacker uh, who hacked uh, a bunch of federal agency stuff uh, during the Soviet Union. This is the book that the, um, uh, the Cuckoo's Nest with Cliff Stoll was written about back in the 90s. Um, the story is a bit, um, I phrase this, fictionalized, we'll say. Um, so it, the movie maybe like take it with a grain of salt and I mean it's, about as bad as the fictionalization in Takedown for Mitnick, so like keep that in mind. Uh, and then finally, I had to include like Hugh Jackman laughing hysterically at a crap ton of monitors, right? Like, but in this sequence, right, he's compiling a worm and he's pulling this information from resources that he's kept in, uh, I think it was like in uh, uh, UCLA's basement or something like that, right? He's consulting a grimoire. We might not call it that, it might not be a book, but it's a grimoire. And then obviously we have to talk about the granddaddy of it all, hackers. Um, once There's two sequences in hackers that really kind of stick this concept in my head. The first one's in the nightclub. The uh, illustrious Matthew Lillard, playing the character serial killer, comes and sits at the table in Cyberdelia. And Ramon, sitting across the table, goes, hey, you got the coloring books? And Matthew Lillard goes, yeah, man, check the color rainbow. And he starts pulling out these books that are all colors, that are colored books. Um, in this sequence, a couple of these books are actually like books that in the 90s hackers were passing around, things like ASA secured network, NSA secured networks, um, security standards, that sort of stuff. There's actually two real like retail books that were in this, um, the Pink Tie book, which was the guide to IBM PCs, and the Unix Devils book, which was actually a book. Um, but these were actually books that were passed around the scenes in like the late 80s, early 90s among the hackers, like uh, in uh, 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 BBSs and that sort of thing. And then to pivot to the end of my Pepe Silvia Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, there's a sequence where literally Mark Antony, the singer, who is in this film for a very brief moment of time, he's reading something there. And uh, earlier in the film, there's a sequence where him and his partner are sitting in the car. He's reading the, uh, the Hacker's Manifesto, which technically was in frack. But in this sequence, Mark Antony is actually reading a copy of 2600. Um, and that's where we're going to go into being my finishing of Pepe Silvia, right? So... And I'm in a room full of information security professionals. You probably know what 2600 is. If you don't, congratulations, you're one of the 10,000 today. Um, 2600, especially for me, was part of my formative years when I was learning about hacking and, and information security in general. Um, it's a quarterly magazine. It's published by a man who is the pen named Emmanuel Goldstein, who was a non-credited consultant on the movie Hackers, uh, and also greets to the prophet. He's the publisher of a column called The Telecom Informer, it seems like a really cool dude via the text that he writes. But the reason this was important to me, in August, uh, or excuse me, in the summer of 2010, I was a freshly shaved, weirdly enough, Geek Squad agent working at the Geek Squad in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I was reading this issue of the Hacker Quarterly, Why You Need a Grimoire, written by a guy named the pen name Leviathan. Um, this literally, like, I know it sounds really silly, but this kind of set into motion stuff in my career that brings me to where I am today. Um, he makes a lot of great points, even in an article that was written in 2010 about stuff that comes in the future, funnily enough. Um, a website that we know contains an answer goes to crap, um, and high Google AI search engine stuff, like, holy cow. Um, other notes, 
It's okay if your grimoire is disorganized. So he talks about the grimoire, and obviously this is an eye chart. If you literally search for why you need a grimoire, there's a couple of internet reposts of this, or of course archive.org is your friend. Um, a couple of other notes. The grimoire goes everywhere, right? These are notes that he talks about in this. But the big thing is like, you're essentially the wizard walking into a room when everything is going wrong and you're consulting your book. So my experience with this has been that I've been mostly digital in the past. I've kept, I've kept Notepad++ heavy on the memory usage, we'll say, a lot of tabs. Um, more recently, I've gotten physical with it. Um, a good notebook, like he describes in this article, is actually like a damn refreshing thing. Um, and I'll, I'll show one picture of mine. Uh, I'm a disorganized mess, right? Like this is not a document I would share with somebody, but it was a document that I would tell somebody about what's in it. Um, I'm into looking into new technologies. I heard the Remarkable's pretty cool. I'm still trying to figure out that like, do I want to go digital or do I want to stay physical to keep it to myself? Um, so based on all that, let's define what we are meaning by the hacker grimoire. This is a personal repository of technical information with some amount of structure. It doesn't have to be perfect. Keeping it personal is sort of a little cheap like mind hack to get you to force yourself to use it, right? If it's yours, you'll use it. Like you'll want to keep notes in it. Um, I've put a bunch of stickers on mine, but you can do what you do, right? Um, it doesn't specifically have to be digital or physical. Um, like I was talking about on a previous one, I've kind of bounced in between the two. It really, at the end of the day, has to be what works for you and what will get you to do what you need to do to write in it. Um, I said stick a pin in this, but I actually moved the slide around. So the pin was from the previous slide, go figure. Um, it should be easy to access without delay, which is part of the reason why I've kind of stuck, I went back to sort of the physical, because this is something I can throw in my backpack, I can throw it in the car, I can keep it with me. Um, if you have ways to uh, keep your spell book on you digitally, do so, right? Like, give yourself that ability to do that. Some obvious do's and don'ts. And some of these were described in Lothiathan's work, some of them weren't. Um, don't do the obvious stuff. Don't put your actual passwords in your document. Um, I don't think I have to say this to a room full of security people, but you know. Um, but, you know, there's an asterisk there, right? Keep default passwords, or if you need to like help yourself, remind yourself of a particularly complex password and you think the paper is the best way to do it, maybe do that, as long as it's not the actual password. Also, don't be dumb and record crimes. I mean, do crimes, but don't record them, right? <laughs> um, now, it is a notebook. If you're doing it in a notebook, at least you could burn it in worst case, right? Uh, and he actually, once again, I think he actually describes that in the article, which I think is kind of funny. Um, some less obvious stuff, though, don't use acronyms that aren't defined or immediately obvious to yourself. I have a few pages, only, not only in this, but in previous grimoires of mine, where I've used an acronym, come back to it like a year and a half later and went, what the hell did I write here? I didn't define it. Oh no, like this is pretty terrible and it, it ends up being problematic. Additionally, you probably want to avoid writing down code to an extent, if, especially if you're doing this in like a physical form. If you're doing this in a digital form, you could probably get away with it. It's kind of hard to transpose code from written to text, but, but people could do it, right? Um, I, I think generally speaking, if you do pseudocode, that's fine. Some do's. Um, do shorthand though, right? Like get a shorthand that works for you and use it. So uh, if you, as big of a nerd as I am, I debated in high school. Um, when, I debate, when you debate, when you do policy debate, you learn how to do what's called flow, and that's the idea of taking like quick notes and, and being able to come back to them. Um, that lot taught me how to do shorthand, but you gotta do you, right? You gotta learn and do something that you can maintain yourself. Um, as an acronyms, if consistent, are actually good. Um, but here is what I'm saying. Note about your accomplishments in this book, right? I have stuff in mind of meetings that I took or projects that I completed where I'm gonna be able to refer to this at the end of my fiscal year to write my review up for my boss so they're happy and maybe that helps me, right? Um, and do reference other documents. There are other grimoires out there, right? I think people have seen like the, um, the red team field manual, the RTFM or the blue team field manual or the purple team or whatever color team, or the operator's handbook, or what have you. Those are grimoires, right? And you can refer to them or just copy them wholesale for yourself. Um, that's one of the things that gets talked about a bunch in um, 
Leviathan's text is about like, hey, I got this like Unix command that I maybe use once in a blue moon, but if I have it documented, at least it's documented somewhere. Um, so do that, right? Like reference those other documents. Um, additionally, referencing internal documentation is good too. Um, but you do want to take caution, right? Um, a lot of companies are very specific about what internal documentation you may or may not be leaving, letting leave the building. Um, but also like take it everywhere you can. We're gonna put the tack in the internal documentation stuff, right? This is sort of my call out to CISOs in a sense. Um, one thing that every company I've worked with in my career and even companies that I've worked with as in like not worked for but worked with in my career have struggles with institutional knowledge, right? You got that person, like the guy I was talking about earlier who's worked at the company 10 years, maybe 20 years and they had all that information in their head which is a good place to have it, but also like if they win the lottery and they leave the next day, you don't have that information anymore. Um, so I encourage that maybe encouraging employees to have a grimoire, even if it's a personal documentation of some variety, like a OneNote, encouraging note taking in general, I think really might help a transition when an employee does leave. Um, I do say giving employees a platform to do this is okay, but be weary. Um, this is like the social media talk that like nobody ever gave at some point in your life where it's like, don't write the real personal stuff in your work stuff, like keep that separation, right? That work-life balance. But I think that more companies focusing and sort of encouraging their employees to do this might ultimately help everybody sort of have better vibes. So I'm gonna give you a peek at a page. Now I had to redact a bit out of this, quite a bit of this actually, um, and it's, my handwriting is miserable. Um, I'm pretty sure doctors do better handwriting than me. So just to give you that like four foot warning. Um, this book is actually pretty cool in that it has, uh, on one side it has the week calendar and on the opposite side it has lines. Once again, like this to me, I needed something like this to do my job. I also needed a good pen. Um, like I haven't gotten into pens yet as a hobby, but I'm pretty sure I've like dipped my toes in it with the pen I currently have, um, which I actually don't remember the name of. It's written on the side. Yeah, Uniball Jetstream. It's a like a 0.2 inch thing. It doesn't run. Like that's the worst thing ever is getting a pen, like small rant. Worst thing ever, having a pen that runs when you write, uh, especially if you're trying to do this yourself by hand, having a pen that runs when you write your hand over it is like a killer. Um, it, it literally stopped me for like a week when the pen I was using started to bleed on my hand. It was not fun. Um, but as you can see here, um, kind of, uh, things I have in this, like I had a discussion about threat modeling at some point that week. I talked about uh, an NMAP scan that I did in a local network, um, uh, a meet some meetings that I had. Um, actually, funnily enough, when I submitted my talk for RRVASAC, I noted that in my notebook, um, that I was actually complete with doing that, which submitting talk discussions is interesting. We'll just leave that one hanging. Uh, RVASAC was awesome in it, though. Um, and then I even noticed some more sillier things, like things that I've worked on in my like personal time. Uh, I finished uh, Beyond Oasis that week, which Beyond Oasis is a great video game if you haven't played it. Uh, once again, I go back to my who am I about being a big nerd. Um, and then talking about like Google, wor Google workplaces, I worked on something internally for myself, not work related, which is why it isn't blacked out. Um, yeah, so I mean like, this is a disorganized mess, right? It's relatively organized for me. Um, but this works for me, and what works for you might, may or may not be the same thing, right? Um, so I'm running, I ran a little bit quickly, but we're going to wrap some stuff up here. So first off, I'm going to reiterate, imposter system is totally legit, and it's okay if you're dealing with it, right? Um, as security professionals, we have to deal with a lot, as I've presented in various forms in this talk. Um, it's totally normal, and that's okay. Um, and talking to your coworkers about it is totally acceptable, or talking to people that you consider people to talk to. Like, like it's fine. You aren't alone dealing with it. Um, there's, there's definitely been a few too many incidences where people have taken drastic actions upon themselves because they've dealt with these problems. And I think as a community, we've gotten better at this, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and like, realistically speaking, we should really embrace the wizards we all are. We deal with advanced technology on a regular basis. Basis, basis, basis. Um, like, we just should be wizards, right? Like, screw it, embrace it. Um, so yeah, so uh, 
Quick shout outs, contact me. You can hit me up on Mastodon. If you're not on the InfoSec Exchange Mastodon, I strongly encourage it. We have a lot of really awesome minded people on there. Um, the shout outs to my partner for her support. Wow, that hit me a little bit. Uh, shout outs to my Stall 3 crew. Uh, you know who you are and my VGZ.CX community. Um, the people on Information Exchange are awesome. It's Operator Jerry is a selfless individual who does that work. Um, big shout outs to him. Uh, I love Deviant. I've talked to him a few times at a bunch of different conferences. He's a great dude. Uh, Real Hack History, who is a great person to follow if you're silly like me and want to get more into like the hacker culture of yesteryear, especially if you weren't like specifically of that era. Uh, and the Gibson, who's part of the CDC. Uh, and that's it. Uh, any questions? Uh, if you don't want to talk about it right now, that's cool. I'll be at the casino night. I'll be standing around. Feel free to come up and chat. I'm more than willing to talk. Thank you very much.